Code of Rule, Part 3. There was more fluid in a glob of varic spit than in an ox-spilled belly. The Imperator had requested a few minutes to take counsel and had it drawn away from Grummer's throne. Now he stared with all his eyes. The spit sizzled in the dust, inches from his toes. Bubbles struggled to the top and burst. It looked as if it could move on its own. Such blatant disrespect had erupted only recently, after Margok had casually mentioned that refusing Hellscream's offer was the reasonable course of action. None of the Centurions had seen the spit yet. He nudged rocks over it to no avail. Varog was nearly howling as he barreled back and forth. His animal pacing seemed increasingly likely to agitate the orcs into using their weapons. Korath dumbly fought to understand. Imperator, you, you cannot mean it. You, you will stall for time to trick Gromish into... Now, Varog shouted, his normally sleek voice peaking. You vowed before the council with both voices. You said you would make peace. Now cringe at the cost. Margok raised his eyes from the spit, indignation and amusement mixing the palates of his faces. Verog had not stopped ranting. What value are traditions if none of the High Mall exists to continue them? Is your sorcery more precious to you than our lives? Lazy, more an invitation than a question. Margok took a single step toward Verog, putting his leg down hard enough to raise dust. You took a survival like a slave who cannot see beyond his chains. You have the heart of an orc, happy just to have the bad moments end. Varog's face was nearly purple. He growled loudly enough for the whole camp to be in an earshot. The other ogres tromped closer to their leaders. Morgok continued. Kog Grunslayer knew that to be free to live was a mere beginning. When he broke the bodies of the Grun, opened their bones, and ate their marrow to prove that they were not gods, he raised their skeletons up so others could see his victory. He desired more than simple survival, so he built his hall to be large for any one blood family to fill. Others gathered, and soon his home was an empire. You did not simply flee into the mountains to wallow in existence. Some sense to have stayed with Varog, for he kept quiet while the Imperator spoke. To Varog, to others, where there were two minds, it was always necessary to have three speeches. The world belongs to us. Its vastness is tamed, its greatness revealed, only because we master it as the forgers did. If you would share our power with the slaves, would let them mold the earth, you are no ogre. In response, the High Counselor landed another hunk of spit atop the first, what talent he had, where it mattered most. Verog had ceased his stalking, he snorted. Heimal is an empire no longer. It is but one great city. I wonder if all in our clan agree that it is worth dying over. Verog's voice was heavy with mucus, but it barely concealed his eagerness. His eyes darted back and forth among the other ogres, never meeting Margox, as though he was on the brink of denouncing the Imperator of a roaring the challenge he had likely rehearsed several times before his turn as a codpusher. Korath spoke up, drawing attention away from Margok and Verog, glaring at each other. Imperator, the orcs say they, they are winning. If you will not strike a Gromish now, then, then we must submit to them. His eyes blazed. Morgok crossed his arms in unconscious imitation of one of his favorite statues. Then the legacy of Oguru, of my blood family, becomes cheap barter. What will you sacrifice? Your fortunes? Your honors from the Colosseum? Your lives? Verag did not hesitate, though he looked at the Centurions, not at the Imperator, while he answered. I will give anything to save our people. While we dither, the clan dies. Of course, Varog hurried to voice his solidarity, aligning himself with our people before Morgok could. Reaching for the rest of the retinue's support, could he sway them to murder? In High Maul's history, more debates had become spontaneous revolts than the Imperator cared to count. Morgok looked around quickly, careful not to let any emotion show. Varog's eyes were wolfish, erratic. At any moment he could erupt in a smile or a howl. The others had their naked fists pressed against their chest in salute. But to whom? They were five, and he was one. 
he gifted them all with twin nods of assent. Very well. I will sell our magic. Slaves cannot take slaves. What can orcs do with the power of the forges that we have not already accomplished? Grim-faced, but assured, the ogres marched back toward Gromash. Morgok lingered behind. Fighting with his smiles, Varog had revealed himself. Morgok had been convinced. It was as close to a humble relent as he had ever offered to one of his advisors. Champion, a fool's position, and the masses could not help standing together to fight it. It suited them, just as it suited all graspers, all peasants, to believe that one who loomed above their lives was vain and self-important, would choose death before sacrifice, would sooner lead his people into the whispers of history than down a low path loudly. This, too, was why Morgok was king. The sun had long gone out, and the thick fumes from yellow torches illuminating Grumashar commingled with the smog that hung above its walls. Morgok breathed deep, the stench relaxed him. He kept his voice soft, one of his heads inclined farther than the other. Will you teach the ways of magic-breaking, Gromish Hellscream? A smile, enthusiastic and genuine, crept over Gromish's face. There was a unique sweetness to an enemy beaten, and a quessing a few feet in front of you, his eyes open and knowing. Call off your army, and send ten of your keenest minds back with us to Highmore. I will instruct them personally. They will be capable within a year, perhaps sooner. One of Gromish's eyebrows rose at that. He scowled, four meaty fingers drumming on the axe haft, but his voice was measured. Do not taunt me, Imperator. You will teach all orcs who have the capacity to learn, and you will do so here. Margok threw his arms wide and grinned, both mouths open. They were smiles of abundant promise, usually reserved for kin he planned to slaughter. Once I share magic with your entire army, you will have no need for my people. What will you do with ogres who are useless to you? If the ogre's skull sagging from Gromash's throne had kept its eyelids, it would have winked. Gromash sneered back at him. Your worthy will live. Trust the value of your magics, ogre. You have no other option. From behind came the sound of a foot march. Seconds later, a few more orcs approached unheralded, unsheathed weapons, slapping their legs. The messenger was first among them, and all eyes, ogre and orc alike, turned to her. Gromage held up a hand for silence. Yes? They attempted to bring reinforcements by sea, War Chief Hells Green. Four ships sailed toward High Mall, but we turned our cannons on them. None reached the shore. Her movements were ebullient. The remains of the enemies are holding up in the towers. We will overrun their stronghold shortly. She looked as though she might sink. Morgog glanced down at his right hand. It was knob-knuckled, big enough to take down an elec, to squeeze an orc's ribs through his chest. It was also trembling. He willed it to stop, first lazily and then wholeheartedly, but it did not. The ground pitched. Shouts of fear met the scrapes of blades. From the corners of his eyes, Morgok saw Koroth charge toward Gromash's throne, knocking two orcs bodily on their backs and trampling over them. His pillar arms stretched wavering. A thin spear whistled through the air, lodged wobbling in his shoulder. The breaker's blood pumped out and over the wood, but like a boulder rolling through the mud. He kept crashing forth, and Morgok wrapped one arm around him, palming Kolros' throat and slamming him backwards onto the ground with such force that nearby trees lost their leaves in puffs and orcs fell onto their backs. As the wind whistled out of the breaker's lungs, Morgok planted a foot on his gut, watched his face contort in pain. <coughs> he yelled down. Grandma shot to his feet. Dozens of orcs aimed blades and spears at Morgok, easing his foot off the breaker's abdomen. Morgok rose to his full height and met the war chief's eyes wary. His breath sucked in and body knotted in anticipation. He was bigger. Hellscream was faster. If Morgok could awaken the slumbering stone before the orc got within an axe length, then lean into the swing with his shoulder. You would dare try to kill me in my home. Hellscream roared, and it truly was a roar. No nearby sound presumed to be louder. His fingers flexed, tense, release. Both hands gripped the axe. 
He looked at the other ogres, breath heavy with rage, and they seemed to seethe in response as one body. The premise of diplomacy was wilted. He would need to sprint for the cart, had they moved it. Four orcs advanced on Morgok with ferine padding steps, spreading into two groups, raising their weapons, flanking him. He clutched the smooth stone that he had once found its way into his palm. Both sets of teeth champed at his tongue so hard he tasted blood. Wait, Grummer's voice was low, more consistent. Morgok watched a bit of that twisting fury, the curled lips and stretched knuckles, ebbed from the other orcs when Hellscream spoke. This was not the Imperator's duty. The war chief looked at where Korath lay. A few weapons lowered, but only a few. Yet Grommar's cold eyes remained slits. He panted, not out of wariness, but wrath at the simple promise of violence. It does not change my demand. You will agree to teach us now, or you will all die. Four bolded-shouldered orcs kept Varog pinned. Their spears inched from his chest. On the ground, the breakers groaned, moved his head back and forth with orc boots on his arms. Then let us speak of the terms. Morgok replaced the stone in his robes, held his palms up. Those who relied on weapons to kill were often reassured by the sight of empty hands. Gromosh Hellscream said nothing. Pick him up, Morgok gestured carefully, and the centurions dragged Korath into a squat, yanking the spear from his shoulder with a shiver and a spurt of red. The orcs exchanged curt nods with their leaders. The distractions of quivering blades and spears aimed at eye level grudgingly receded, but the sheer number of armed orcs staring at Morgok was oppressive. Sweat began to speck his horn, and the Imperator rubbed it away, sneaking a moment to gather his thoughts. Gromash had calmly, quickly, much faster than his legendary anger would suggest, and without slaking his bloodthirst, did he mean to leverage the attack in their negotiation? Or was it this new killing machine, appearing as if from nowhere, the glint in Gromash's eyes when magic was mentioned, the breaker left alive despite attacking a war chief? Prove your worth, the messenger had said. Oh, magic was not merely part of the bargain, Morgok's lips passed conspiratorially. You need them. Why? Gromish remained quiet. What power do you fear? The war chief did not react with the cannon spittle that Morgok anticipated. Instead, he settled back down on his throne. End of part three.